Hello, excellent. Uh, my name is Gabriel Wapblat, uh, also known as Swami G, and I am here with Inara Tabir, and uh, just so happy to have this conversation with you. Um, and this is for our inter in sprint interview into terrorism mo movement uh, trans religion, and so uh, excellent. Yeah, really happy to have you know connected with you, become aware of all the amazing things that you're doing. Um, in this space. And so um, just to, to kind of, you know, get it started, um, uh, why don't you give us, you know, a little personal bio history backgrounds um, and how you got to, you know, everywhere up to Galaxus Girl and then, you know, where are we going from there? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I grew up in foster care in a really small town in Northern Arizona. So it was like 6,000 people and far more cows than people in this little tiny town. And it was mainly Mormons. And um, the way I got there was my father was a con artist and he was in a camp full of people that were running a scam um, town to town. They had a big top tent and they were doing Christian revivals and they would go town to town and take money from people and you know pickpocketing and selling prayers and all that kind of stuff. So we ended up on the move and we went up to uh, this small town called Concho, and they were kind of working their con around various towns all around. And my father got into a fight with the camp runner, the, the guy who ran the camp. And so we got kicked out of this camp and we ended up in the town and we ended up in foster care because my father was, you know, on drugs and not very stable. And, um, and the people in the town did not like us because all the stuff that had happened to them from this group of con artists, we kind of got to bear their sins for my the rest of my childhood basically we never got to live it down and um, so I grew up in a very hostile kind of environment and I ended up in 12 different foster homes foster placements group homes foster homes respite care um, in this small town and I um, was gay and at 16 I got outed for being gay so when I got outed I was a straight A student National Honor Society academic decathlon and the next day after I was outed by my librarian I started getting death threats from parents, from teachers, from students. And so their answer to this was to move me outside of town to a small school for delinquents. It was like 18 kids and a parole officer. And I realized at that moment that inclusion meant I could be there if I was invisible. And so this kind of, it started off my understanding of like, there's really no place for me in this world. It's not really designed for me. And part of, part of that process was looking inward and trying to figure out myself. And so I think though it was a terrible thing, it made me more observant of the world around me. I, I didn't take anything as was. I had to question everything. And that's, I think that's where I really give the credit for my mentality of um, not accepting society as it is and knowing that we can do better. And so with that, I also, uh, at, you know, I don't know, teenage years, mid teenage years, I got a hold of a stack of National Geographics from this little thrift store. And it was like everything from 1960 to 1993. And I was, my, my mind was blown because I had always thought there, the world was this little tiny place. And I had these little limited possibilities and I wasn't sure where I fit. But when I started looking through these magazines, it was like different cultures, different religions, dinosaurs, astronauts, like the whole world came to life. And I was like, oh my God, there's so much out there. And it made me really hungry for all of that and to figure out how to get to more of that. And then I read The High Frontier by Jerry O'Neill. And that is where I caught the bug. Jerry O'Neill gave this vision of a future where it wasn't about um, being limited. It was about anybody and everybody who had been left behind could go to space and there we could find real equity. And I'm like, oh my God, not only can I go find dinosaurs and other cultures and ceremonies and I can find space, you know? So I became extremely hungry for space. And when I aged out of foster care at 18, my 18th birthday, they set me on the side of the road outside the foster care office with a trash bag full of clothes and said, it's on you now. And I had no family, no money, no education, no driver's license. So that for the first couple of years, I struggled quite a bit, you know, bouncing around, doing what I had to survive. And eventually, and I thought, you know, I can never be this thing I want to be. I can never be a scientist. I don't have the right money or education or support. But eventually I realized I have a superpower. Because of all the homes I'd been to, I had to learn to adapt very quickly. Every home had a different culture, a different religion, different parental structures. So I could become anything. I could communicate really well. So I put these skills of communication you know, in front of me. And eventually I got in the early days of social media and Facebook, 
I was able to build these massive groups. So anything over a million members back in the day that was science-based on Facebook, I ran that. And so I was able to build this huge network for the Jovian Society, which is now defunct. And I would go to these space co companies and orgs and I would say, you're doing amazing things, but nobody knows about it. I'd love to get you the word out there with the public and I'll do it for free. So they'd be like, okay, yeah, whatever kid, here you go. I'll like put this out there. And this is before Facebook really like blocked you from, you know, mass sharing. And, you know, it was really wide open. So I would get these huge responses for them and they'd come back and they'd say like, what do you want? You know, they think you want some money, obviously. But I would say, I want two things. If you go to space before me, you take me with you and we have a coffee on the moon. And if I call you for a meeting with somebody, you take the meeting. You don't have to give them what they want, but you have to take the call. And so this became my currency. The fact that I was able to get them exposure allowed me to ask them for meetings for other people. So I was able to build a really great network. And ever since then, that's what I've been doing for years is building these networks of people and putting together the puzzle of space. I am adamant about getting humanity to space. To me, it's like everything for us to have all these possibilities wide open and to end scarcity, not just scarcity of resources, but scarcity of the mental set or the mindset or the human spirit really. Like we need to know that we can press beyond this limited bubble that we're in, in all ways, including spiritual, which brings us to terrorism, of course. Um, for me, I think we're at our best when we push our boundaries and humanity is this really unique species in that we don't just accept things as they are. We want to change things and alter them for ourselves. We're unreasonable and it's a beautiful thing about us. So with TerraSM, it ties into my understandings of our potential to end death, to uh, push any kind of physical boundaries past where we currently are. And that's what I want for my kids and for my grandkids and for humanity. Um, but I've been looking for a long time, you know, as somebody who was very unstable in childhood, I tried to find my place in life. And that included bouncing from religion to religion to religion, you know, and trying to figure out like where I fit. Cause I've always been very spiritual and very connected to the cosmos. I used to go out every time I'd move to a new foster home. I, the first night I would go outside and I would look up and I'd see the stars. And it was always my sense of grounding myself because no matter what had changed in the home, whatever had changed in my life because of that move, I could look up and see the same sky. And so that was my first real sense of spirituality. But I had, you know, gone through all these different religions as a child and as an adult, and I couldn't find my spot. But um, I watched Battlestar Galactica. It may sound hokey, I don't care. Um, it really inspired me. Um, the struggle of good and evil, of the cycles of time, of um, understanding that there's a story we're all part of and that we take different roles on in that story and understanding the connection points. I was just enraptured by the Cylons. And, the, and, and really the interplay between humanity and the Cylons, I think it's really our interplay between our own limitations and how we limit ourselves as a species and our potential. So, you know, that made me really hungry and I couldn't find this thing until TerraSM. And then when I landed in it, I was like, oh my God, this is literally my path. And it just clicked. And it, for the first time, I didn't have to change anything about myself. It wasn't I had to fit inside a box where I may kind of fit, but I had to alter something. I just walked in and it was like, this is for me. You know, so this is kind of how I got here. Awesome. That's such a great story. Um, there's, uh, you know, a few viewpoints, particularly that I want to, you know, pick out in there. Um, one also is, you know, the the amazing role that National Geographic, you know, has done for so many people to open them up to the vastness, uh, the beauty of diversity uh, that is out there. So, I, I remember, you know, growing up and still when I, you know, go around and, and visit my parents' places, um, you know, Martin has a collection, I think, of every National Geographic going back to like the 70s, I think, wow. you know, I know exactly in Vermont where the October 1982, uh, which is the month, you know, I was born, um, copy of the National Geographic is, and as actually so the cover of that National Geographic is a chip in the hand oh, and wow. it's talking about like the coming, <laughs> like, you know, um, and it was like back in 82 and it's talking about like this, like, you know, you know, uh, revolution in, you know, and, and the chip technologies and like, you know, I think it talks, gets into Moore's law and all that stuff. So it's, uh, you know, just, uh, yeah, you know, really incredible. And I think it is um, a great inspiration. I also, when I was homeschooled in seventh grade, our office 
um, uh, World Space at that at that time was right across the street from National Geographic's uh, um, museum and headquarters in Washington oh, wow. D.C. So I used to you know literally just you know uh, I'd go in there for you know natural sciences or whatever you know and I I go see a program or walk the halls of National Geographic and uh, yeah I've gained and learned so much uh, from that. Uh, so also though it's a very interesting. Um, story that you have in, with religion and religious organization, right? Um, having really kind of been um, in a in a tribe, uh, you know, um, of of sorts, and um, you know, and and I think from an early point, an interesting juxtaposition be between like you know giving these revivals but also like seeing that there was clear theft you know and other malfeasance you know going on around it and you know the framing uh that that has um being cast out being continually cast out having to 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 you know navigate very different frameworks and the natural adaptability that you have to develop to be able to to go through that um, but also, I think this, um, you know, skepticism around authorities and whatnot, you, you could just see because when you when you're in one system, you it becomes ingrained, you really take it, you know, kind of like that's that's how everything is. But when you keep coming through households and systems, all these things begin to become arbitrary, you know, because they didn't matter here. And now it's so important. Um, and so that's a very interesting play of adaptability, which I think is something that is really critical in this coming of age that we're going through. That I think when we talk about the changes and how we will need to process information, um, the sense of self, particularly, this is something I think that, um, that perspectives like yours um, are are better adapted to um, wrap their mind and body around a new substrate, you know. And so I think someone who's lived like you know sixty years, like you know, heavily ingrained that that their self of identity is this bot is this body and sense sense of self that it would be very difficult leap you know, for their body to accept this new body, right? So I think when we start talking about like consciousness transplantation, right, that there are ways of thinking that I think that we need to kind of train ourselves. And I think to a degree, this, this you know, these Buddhist notions of if, if kind of breaking down the self, you know, are, are a part of that. You know, I think that you, that at least someone will need to, to try to train and process um to to go through there so i think there's a lot of great seeds you know um you know within your story and you know and and how all of that you know brought you to to terrace m and again how how throughout all these different groups like you know again like nothing seemed to fit or quite get it in the way that that terrace m does so um let's take a a, a moment and and maybe if you want to talk about some of the different you know, religious groups, the organizations that you've been through and maybe how they affected you and if, you know, any likeness um, to, uh, you know, TRSM in any ways. Yeah, absolutely. So I think two of the bigger ones that have had an impact on me are um, Islam and Judaism. So with Islam, you know, I can remember getting up early and walking to the masjid for Fajr prayers, which is like, you know, extremely early at five in the morning or something. And just the the preparation and the quiet time of the and the intention of like walking there. And one of the people that was educating me was saying like you you don't get the full um, impact of this prayer in the morning if things aren't quiet and if you don't walk there if you don't have time for contemplation don't drive you know. So it was like I think a good mile and a half or something from my house and I would walk there and just that idea of preparing the mind and finding that quiet space and that intention. And then it was always empty. It was like me and this guy from Serbia every morning. We were like the only two that would show up and just um, being alone with the cosmos and connecting that sense of direct connection. So from Islam, I learned about direct connection. It was no longer these interest areas, 
intercessories be between you and the divine. It was just this idea that there was this complete connection. And so that bring me, that brought me great peace. And um, I still retain that sense of like direct connection. And with Judaism, it was Shabbos. Like for me, Shabbos was the most amazing time where, you know, I'm, I'm in this time between time where nothing is going to be produced and you're reflecting on the week that has been, but you're not going to sit and document it. You're not going to write about it. You're going to be in a, a contemplative kind of rest uh, phase, but you're not only looking back at like where the week was, you're looking forward. And there's something incredible about this moment where you're not allowed to do certain things. So you can't um, suddenly correct something like, oh my God, I forgot to do this on Wednesday. So I'm gonna try and squeeze it in now. Like there is no choice. You have to just stop. And you have to accept the fact that that was not completed. And I think that is part of accepting um, a sense of death in our, in our world where we have to die a little bit sometimes. And we have to realize that things aren't always going to get done. So accepting that sometimes um, non-completion is completion. And that, you know, and then also looking forward, if you know, it's almost like being between lives. If you know that you didn't do something and you lost the opportunity to finish it because now you're in that period, the next week you come in with a bigger intention. You come with that sense of purpose where I better make the most of this week because I don't want to be here on Shabbos wondering why I didn't complete this thing or being stuck in like, as a writer, for instance, it's hard to get writer's block for me anymore when I'm looking at, you know, oh my gosh, if I don't get this done on Shabbos, I'm be sitting there with a million ideas in my head. I'm going to want to get them out. Um, so for me, that was like the biggest part of what I learned from Judaism and then the sense of community. So the rabbi was saying, you know, you can't stay in your house and study some books and become Jewish and you, the ideas aren't going to matter. It's about the community. If you're not connecting with the people, then it's not alive in you. There has to be a circuit. And this idea that like Judaism is a living circuit between the people that are, that belong to it. And um, he said something that really stunned me. He was talking about Sinai and how every Jew that ever existed or ever will exist was there when the law was given. So there, there's this continuity between all those times. Like every Jewish soul was there at that time, accepting that moment. And that's what connected all of them. And I look at that, like when I'm thinking about the cycles of time, this idea of linear time doesn't really exist. Especially when I look at like Tarasim's ideas of, you know, all these things were put here by us later, but before this, and that, that's what I think that loop really represents for me is that there is no disconnect between these different time periods and cultures and all of it is interflowing. So I still take that forward with me from Judaism. And then, you know, I, I experimented with like Buddhism, you know, Taoism, uh, Druidism, paganism, more of these like um, esoteric kind of faiths. And I learned to connect with nature mostly from those. And the sense that, you know, I'm not greater than the world I come from. I'm a piece of that. I'm, I'm an interconnected piece of it. So uh, when I look at, I come from the desert. So when I look at nature and including the cosmos, it's not some place. Like it's functioning within us and we're functioning within it. Even the sense of our biorhythms from the sun and from the moon, like all of that's interconnected. When you walk barefoot on the earth, you know, that is recharging your batteries because you're meant to be in contact with all these different pieces and um, just learning to respect myself as a part of nature, an integral part of nature, and realizing there is no, there is no real separation. Um, the Baha'i faith was another one I found a lot of, a lot of peace in. And I, I loved that when I first came to the Baha'i faith, I was really annoyed, actually. <laughs> I was like, you're, you're trying to tell me all these religions are, are consistent with each other. And, you know, I was, my, my brain was like, no, I see hypocrisy and I see disconnection. And I was trying to make it work in, a, in a, the way I've been taught, basically. And I'm like, well, you can't tell me that this religion can be reconciled with that religion. But the idea that um, like source or God or divinity is like light. And each of the religions is like a light bulb. And you can go room from room and there can be different light fixtures and different size bulbs and different you know, wattage. But the same, no matter where you go, that energy is coming from the same exact source. And maybe in one room, you need a really bright light. And maybe in another one, you need a dimmer light. And so it really broke this sense of I had to find the right path. And that was the first time I, re I realized I wasn't going from religion to religion to find the right path. I was understanding why each one of them was the right path for those who followed it. And so it's like, if you understand that, you're not going to go into a room where someone's quietly reading and kind of has a nice dim reading light. And you're not going to go in there and say, I need this light turned all the way up. It's got to be consistent with the last room I was in. Um, so I, I had to challenge my own preconceptions of 
um, religions aren't interconnected and people can't make can't reconcile their differences and so that Baha'i the Baha'i faith taught me that all of it is working the way it's supposed to and that anyone that is attaching themselves to a spiritual path no matter what it says to me for them it's exactly where they need to be so like for for me for instance you know Battlestar Galactica someone may think it's hokey or silly that a television show can inspire spirituality in me but it's what I needed on my journey and when I look at Tara Sam, it's exactly what I need in my journey, but someone else may not connect with it. Um, so I think that's, again, this is kind of the same thing I got from moving from home to home was that I was able to evaluate these different ways of, of being. And, um, you know, at first invalidating where I needed, where I felt I needed to, but then realizing like all of it is valid and how do we tap into it and why do we tap into it and how can I connect with other people in that way? Yeah, that's a yeah, that's that's a awesome. You know, I too was moved by um, the 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 remake of Battlestar Galactica. Yeah. Um, per particularly, I mean, I think the the original Battlestar I've watched some of, not all of, um, but I think it's a you know based on the book, very strong you know idea concept. But the execution of the remake um did like just just it was so well done and and i mean i mean like cast i mean you know there's there's some great ideas that had bad special effects right but like this was you know this was a space opera at its best but it really did also somehow capture our own history our own future like to link it it told that story and watching it to me it was like you know just give me goosebumps and i was like like first of all i was like oh my god other people get it but like they got it so well and they were able to make like a major like motion series like based on it that tells the story um so eerily well how were they how they were able to to bring in you know um the 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 you know pagan theology and the 13 you know and how many places in our own history that repeats itself um but then bring in you know this uh you know there was like you know parallels to you know the jews and then you know the whole mormon thing and like they like they brought it everything so well and then projected it out you know right to like you know where we are um and you know you see the same interfamily personal dramas you know kind of like playing out um it really it really is uh i you know so so and what that inspired me to to kind of see is that theology and science fiction um share a very common space and I think it is, I mean, I think, honestly, I think theology is science fiction. I agree. I, 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 I think that, I mean, you look at, I mean, like even, uh, I mean, like Terrasem is not the only organization inspired by Octavia Butler's Earth Seed, right? There is an Earth Seed movement, like there's, you know, others as well. Uh, and so even, I mean, at, at when it was published, I mean, people thought, you know, the Book of Mormon was sci-fi, you know, <laughs> it's like, um, but, you know, eventually these things, they, they inspire, right? So I think what it's really, I think the commonality I might call something like aspirational fiction, right? It's, sure. it's where, you know, there's this powerful vision or view and that is, you know, taken on by a whole community and, you know, people are inspired to it um and so i think you know trekkies and star wars i mean certainly it's like you know a religion you know yeah. um and i imagine that this is this is how early storytelling you know when all these things came out you know there was a charismatic person who was able to impress a vision onto other people that inspired them to live in you know uh a, a different ways um i actually did visit the baha'i faith um I believe it's their headquarters in Israel. Is it Mount Carmel? Um, it's, I forget what it was called. It was beautiful. It was, I mean, it was, it was just absolutely, you know, um, just this really like this, I remember like this kind of sloping kind of hillside, just incredibly landscaped, just 
you know, um, picturesque um, shrines and, and stuff through there. Um, yeah, and, and again, you know, that they are teaching a similar position to the Terrasem, you know, position that all of this is congruence, um, that ultimately, you know, it's, it's not the destination, right? It's the journey. Exactly. Um, so it's, it's not ultimately, you know, Nirvana or heaven or, you know, Jesus or, you know, Mohammed, you know, what's important is the community in the process, right? It's the question, you know, not really the, you know, it's the thought process, right? It's asking the question, not whatever, you know, the answer, you know, is it's the process of thinking that is where you are and, and, and are defined as, um, so yeah, there's a, it's a, a lot of uh, you know great stuff, and I love the breadth of your experience. This is something that more and more you know is, I, I see is really very common, um, particularly with people who who find terrorist them. You know, it's because they've they've done it all, right? You know, they you know um, may have been raised Christian and look at Judaism and Muslims and you know Eastern philosophies or you know pagan stuff, and they've gone all over you know, seeking knowledge, seeking, you know, uh, inclusion, uh, and, and ultimately, you know, kind of come to this, this terrorism framework, which is, it, you know, exactly that. It is something that has um, at least aspires to take in, you know, all of these um, beliefs and viewpoints and, you know, to, to, to understand you know, where they're coming from, what their expressions are, um, what their desires are, and, um, and manifest them um, through a, you know, a belief in science as a spiritual process. For sure. Right? Well, I think where, which is necessary because, because belief is very dangerous without science, right? So, so belief without scientific validation inevitably leads to delusion mm -hmm. and and other harm you know based on that so you know belief is very powerful it's it's you know it's something that maybe is somewhat unique in in this consciousness or something that part of this recipe um but it is if not if if not matched with you know that scientific interrogation um, you know, what we can, what we've seen historically is, is very tragic outcomes. For sure. Well, and I, when I think about sci-fi, going back to something you said before, I like to say that the very first sci-fi began when the first cave person went outside and looked up at the stars and went, oh my God, what is that? And they were super inspired by it, but they were mystified by it. That mystical sense of awe is that first moment. And then they go into their cave and they're drawing on the walls, trying to conceptualize what they're experiencing. And then those drawings and those ideas start to spread and those become culture and art and music and all these other pieces to it. But then what happens is that all inspires storytelling and storytelling really is the vehicle for transmitting some of the deeper things we can't normally just talk about. I think a story is, is a magical process where people are able to connect across generations to deeper things within us. And the story really lives outside of us. So we may write a story, may come up with a story or what we can call myths even, so it doesn't matter if it's a sci-fi show or a religious text. We're sharing these stories across generations and they grow and they grow with the communities that harness them. But the, there's something magical about the scientific process, right? I believe it is a divine tool that we, we're imbued with, this ability to dig into our environment and to dig into things around us and to understand them at a, at a more you know, granular level. And that allows the stories to become richer. But we do have, you know, these moments where it's hard. It's it's harder than the easy answers. And so you'll have entire communities that will take the easy answers. And they'll take the ingrained answers that may have been harder to get to. Um, so for, you know, past generations will do all the work. And then we're like, okay, no, Pluto's a planet. I'm sticking with it. I'm not letting go of this. And so I think science really has to bust us out of our routine every generation. It has to make us question even the things we held is scientifically true. And so what I love about science is that it's not afraid to say we got it wrong or we're still in the process of getting it right. And that's really what life is, this journey. Like you say, it's not a destination. That symbol in Terrasam of the figure eight, you know, it's a constant flow. It's not ending. It's always coming back in on itself. And I think this is the idea that you have to reevaluate your ideas constantly. 
And that's what science makes us do. Like, are you sure that's how quantum entanglement works? Let's examine this. Um, and so that's, I think, really powerful and why science should be um, connected to the spiritual rather than disconnected or at odds with it. Awesome. Yeah. And I think another thing is that um, we, is that, you know, some of these things can and are changing, that they're contextual, that, uh, you know, and, and can and should be reevaluated, um, refilled through, you know, through this process. Um, and yeah, it's, it's incredible. So I, I want to go through a couple, um, you know, other questions and, and then get into, in, into the pledge. So, um, how, when, or how do you recall, you know, was your, like, how did TerraSEM as an organization cross your path? So I'm, you know, a transgender woman, and I'm always looking for ways to, you know, raise my community up. And I was creating a site, which I call here, there be dragons.space, which I haven't launched yet. But the idea was to create a, a, a website that has biographies of queer people in the space community. And so I was looking into that and I learned about Martina and I'm like, oh my God, here is this trans woman who transitioned before it was easy. Cause I mean, it's never easy, but it was, you know, very hard when she transitioned. And so I was really inspired by her. So then in reading about her, I found Tara Sim and I'm like, what and how did I not know this was there? And then I saw Life Knot and the whole idea of uploads and mind files. And I just couldn't look away at that point. Awesome, yeah. So that actually was right into the next question is, how do you approach um, mine files? You know, uh, what sites or services, frameworks? Um, you don't need to be, you know, uh, uh, too revealing because this is going to be publicly, you know, shared, whatever. But to the degree that you're comfortable, you know, talk a little bit about what you do and how you approach mine filing, what it means to you. For me, I haven't gotten too much into the formal mine filing yet, which is one of the steps I want to take soon, but I've always been about documenting my journey. I've always wanted to preserve my journey. So when I was younger, it was always about writing my thoughts down and going into like the deep levels of what I was thinking, what I was feeling. I would write about what time it was and what the temperature was like and whether I was cold or uncomfortable while I was talking about these things. And so that was my early stages of trying to preserve who and what I am. And then online, of course, I'm always trying to put my ideas out there and have the longer conversations. But I don't know. I'm, for me, it's, it's hard because in one sense, we are different people with different people. We have different masks or personas at work or with a lover or with a friend. And so online, if I'm in a work mode, I may be one person. And if I'm in a casual setting, I might be another person. So I wonder about like how we reconcile all those different pieces of us. Cause I don't think we even do it well internally, you know, like trying to examine the different pieces of us. I think about the final five and that moment where they realize, oh my God, that moment touches me more than anything in Battlestar Galactic. I've only seen the, the reboot, by the way. Um, but when the final five, they realize, oh my God, I'm not who I think I am. I think we go to those moments of ourselves and that deep introspection of like, do I even really know myself? So the idea of a mind file for me is, do I even know who I am enough to input this information? So I think um, I like the idea of being raw and having other people collect that data and be like, here's who you present as, and here's the entirety of who you present as in the world. And I think that's one piece of who we are, but then like there has to be a lot of introspection because I don't even know. I think at this point, I'm still trying to figure out who and what I am, you know? Yeah, yeah. So actually, I think that this is part beautiful thing about mind filing. Um, it is the process of discovery and definition that... I, I, you know, I feel that in fact, vast majority of us are effectively NPCs in this simulated reality, yeah. right? And if the, and then, so mind filing to me, the more I get to understand it, it is journaling, right? It is scrapbooking um, brought to the next level, right? Where you can um, deconstruct this idea of self and when, you know, it, it is engineering, right? It's like you're taking something apart to learn how it works, right? Not based on belief or feelings or whatnot, but like getting down to like the nitty gritty, you know, and say, you know, 
um, well, you know, what, what am I? What, what really am I, right? And what is I, right? And, and then going back, doing? well, yeah, how, how happy am I with, with I? And I, I personally, like, there's things that I am not proud of and would not necessarily, you know, want to remember or be remembered for. Um, but does that really define who I am and my worth and value? Um, sadly in this society, you know, yes, uh, you know, I could, I could, you know, die or be rewarded, killed, you know, or honored, you know, based, uh, based on, on, on some of these things, but they really shouldn't be really that indicative of, you know, and they can be, you know, valuably important to understand that is, is you, that moment in time or is you this track and then to to go to your your point about persona um in situations that is a face you know, that you wear a mask you wear in these situations what i have come to see about that is that it's not you you are like you're not necessarily the the acting different in these cases you are in different environments and so I am more and more seeing how human behavior is in a, is expression of the ecology, right? And so you will see different behaviors from the same or different people in these environments. And so we're going through this experience, this conscious experience and saying, oh, this is me and I'm acting here, this. It's like, and in fact, it's not your choice. It's that, it's the, it's that environment, the ecology of that environment that dictates this behavior because of these relationships, you know? And then you go over here and it feels to you like I'm putting on a different face. You're walking into a different simulation because sure. there's a different set of code here and there's a different set of code here. And that is the definition of simulation, right? And so when we walk into the Japanese simulation or the Norwegian simulation, right? Um, you you go into a Christian simulation or a Muslim simulation. These are all like, and so this is why I say that written law is the predecessor of artificial intelligence. That from the oh, time wow. Hammurabi, from the time Hammurabi wrote that code down and began enforcing this reality, AI was inevitable. Oh wow, that's I hadn't thought about that because then we're basically right? running, we're running a societal program. Exactly. That's all we're, that's, yeah. And all of this, you know, coming into this virtual reality, you know, is just the code, like oh, wow. making itself better. That, that is phenomenal. Lord. You know, I think about this idea of who we are. And if you think about like the journey we have as human beings, like who I am today, and I, I relate this to the fear some people express with transhumanism and this idea that, you know, becoming more uploading, going the Cylon route, um, will change us and take away who we are as humans. And I try to, you know, help people understand that from day to day, you're completely changed. Who I was in my 20s, like my God, my the version of me in my 20s and the version of me, of me now in my 40s, like we would not be friends. <laughs> We'd have a lot of very different ideas. Like, okay, you need to mature, you know, you need to grow up. And I would probably be very boring to her, but um, we change constantly. We, we change day to day. And, you know, what's holding that continuity? I think that's my question is, am I that conscious being that's making these choices or am i the being driving the car when i phase out like have you ever driven in a car and you you come to and you realize you've been driving for two miles and you don't remember doing it you know like what was driving the car is that you driving the car or is that your core self and so i think that you know it's i still haven't figured out what i am as a being and what pieces of that really constitute consciousness or even if i even if i do have consciousness right and maybe it's just this all of it coming together um, but I think that's where I want to explore my potential with mind files is digging into all these kind of concepts and figuring out what has continuity and what changes and if there is a, even is continuity. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. So I'm going to share the pledge on the screen now. Um, do you see that? I see the symbol. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, all right, good. All right, so this is the uh, the pledge. Uh, I'm going to ask you um, to 
uh, recite that, and then um, we'll really be wrapping up our our Insprint tradition. Fantastic. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the collective consciousness of Terrasem and to the principles for which it stands, education persistently with diversity, unity, and joyful immortality everywhere. Awesome. Awesome. And yep, there is the Terrasem flag and by the power vested uh, in me and Nara, um, welcome as the newest inspirant of Terrasem. Uh, normally, if we were in person, we would touch foreheads um, in, you know, Zoom, I kind of just like just that and say, I am you, you am I, we are one. I am you, you am I, we are one. Yes. And so, yeah, welcome to Terrasum. Thank uh, you. This is, you know, it's been, yeah, incredible. You have such a great story, um, such great, you know, enthusiasm. I'm very happy to, uh, you know, to have you here. I did forget to to ask one thing um, for the record, which is um, uh, if you talk a little bit about um, attendance at terrorism gatherings. The generally the question is, you have you attended a terrorism gathering? You need to have attended one. You know, you've attended many. So just maybe talk a little bit about um, your attendance at gatherings. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we meet every 10th of the month at 10 o'clock. And I find these as refreshing times, like recharging my batteries and connecting with people and all of the buzz of the world kind of dies out. And I can just be in this small room with a few people and they're on the same path and they get it. So it's nice to go through the values and ideas of terrorism together. Cause I, I love that. Like I want to download all of it into a physical book, obviously, and like I make some cards and do all that fun stuff, but nothing really can replace that moment where you're sharing it with other people. So for me, that gathering is this like uh, hub. It becomes the hub for my time and everything swivels around that basically. So it becomes this locked moment in time or this fixed point that everything else can rotate around. And so for me, that's given me a sense of place and a sense of like belonging. That's really important. Awesome, yeah. Um, yeah, we, we really enjoy you uh, participating in the gatherings and um, you know, uh, for everyone listening here, um, 10th of the month at 10 a.m. Uh, local time, um, you know, you can find a, a gathering near you or join us uh, virtually on Zoom or through Discord. And uh, once again, thanks to Nara for taking the time to uh, have this uh, recording in Sprint interview. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me.